We get to لَيْسَ الْبِرْ أَنْ تُوَلْوُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر محمد أسد translates بر as piety but بر is much more than piety okay ليس البر أن تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين وآت المال على حبه ذو القربة واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل والسائلين في الرقاب وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بعهدهم إذا عاهدوا والصابرين في البأساء والضراء وحين البأس أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون So this critical concept of البر and البر is تقوى in the sense of piety but added to that piety is a, a, a set of moral meanings without which you can't say bir exists. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to the, the precisely that point of law and says bir, that moral stature, is not the result of knowing where the, the direction of the compass, whether in prayer or otherwise. In other words, it's not that technical question of the direction that you take when you are praying. That's not what constitutes bir. Meaning, clearly, the technicalities of law is not what constitutes bir. The technicalities of law are an element in the pursuit of birth, but they are never a fulfillment of birth. So, what is birth? Well, first, it is Iman. And Iman in the final day, Iman in all the angels, meaning as we, we've said about some of the Israelite traditions, which discriminated against Gabriel, the angel Gabriel in particular, and the revelation from Allah, revealed book, the prophets. So an all-encompassing iman that doesn't discriminate between the prophets and the angels of the Abrahamic tradition. But then, Bir is impossible unless it has a direct impact upon your relationship to money. And it has to be the money that you cherish, not the money that you can do without, not items that you've used, well, you know, like giving uh, old clothes to goodwill not things that actually don't have an emotional impact upon you, but money that you actually need and desire. In a word, sacrifice. And so you sacrifice, and sacrifice, again, means that you put someone else ahead of your own self, ahead of your own needs, ahead of your own desires. Although I feel I need this, I'm going to deny myself this to benefit someone else. So al-bir itself is piety with the necessary element of sacrifice. Defeating the ego, as Sufis like to put it. But anyway, so that money is given to family in need, dhul qurba, wal yatama, orphans. See how often the Quran emphasizes orphans. Wal masakin and the needy, 
Wabn al-Sabil. Ibn al-Sabil is equivalent to our day and age of the refugee. Ibn al-Sabil is any human being who is away from home in need. So a, tra a traveler, for instance, who's uh, away, any person who's away from their home and in need. And the, the, the ones that fit that category in our day and age are displaced human beings. People who are refugees, people who have lost their homes. Wasailina for Rikab helping Sa'ilina for Rikab has particular two meanings. Helping slaves buy their freedom and helping people who find themselves in indentured servitude because of their debts free themselves. So look at how broad the canvas is. You cannot have bir unless what you think of the, all these categories, the qurba, waliyatama, the relatives, orphans, wal masakin, and the needy, wabn al-sabil, and the refugee, or displaced human beings, was sa'ilina for raqab those who are in an indentured relationship that need to be freed because of their debt. Now, Imam al-Ghazali and others have written about the moral obligation to know because one possible trick that a lot of people fall into unconsciously is to close off their life so that they are not aware of the need of relatives, of orphans, of the needy, of the refugee. So you don't, you, you don't know about the refugees in need because you actually make sure that the news of these people doesn't reach you. Well, the, the Quran obligates you in order to perform the duty of being an ummah wasat that qualifies morally, ethically, to testify, to bear witness, obligates you to know. So it is not an excuse for in the hereafter that you tell Allah, well, you know, I didn't know that there were orphans in Syria, there were orphans in Yemen. I don't know that there were this organization that took care of orphans and, and was in dire need of money. Um, Grace just told me that she read a story about families in Afghanistan selling their daughters to eat. That apparently there are families that are starving to the point that they are selling off their daughters. For this to happen in Muslim lands, let me again, to put it very bluntly, no amount of pietistic affectations, no amount of pretense of SubhanAllah's and Allahu Akbar's, no amount of pretense of discourse upon scarves and hijabs and whatever else we talk about is going to make up for the fact that in the Muslim Ummah there are people, even if they are in Afghanistan or Yemen or Syria or wherever they are, that are in such dire need that they have to sell their children. What is required of your moral consciousness to, to to qualify for that category of bir is to teach yourself to care. A lot of times, and this is just from even life experience has taught me that, is that 
people subconsciously, subconsciously insulate themselves so that the occasion doesn't arise where they have to struggle with sacrificing financially to help those who need. So as I mentioned before, I work in the field of human trafficking and and in, in an hor- one of the horrible fields, uh, uh, trafficking in organs. Trafficking in organs, that, I mean, it, it blows my mind that among the highest categories of people who have their organs trafficked in are Muslims. Uh, not just refugees from Yemen or Syria or Muslims from China, um, which are harvested, but remarkably, Muslims from Somalia and Muslims from Mauritania, Somalia particularly, uh, Muslims from Ethiopia that attempt to get to either, most of the time, the through Libya or through Egypt, either they, they try to migrate to Israel, so to cross through Egypt and enter Israel uh, as undocumented, or to get to a ship on the Libyan coast or the Egyptian coast to try to cross to Europe. Well, a, a good percentage of these people end up being captured by organ harvesters. And a very high percentage of these people are Muslims. And I mentioned before that this ridiculous trade that is called halal organs, that they're actually those who sell the organs on, in the black market, marketed as halal organs, meaning that was harvested from a Muslim. So you're going to have the kidney of a Muslim or a liver of a Muslim or whatever. And most people don't want to hear about things like that. Because once you hear about it, then you feel obligated to do something about it. And, you know, now it's been 30 years of Islamic centers not wanting me to give lectures about that. Oh, we, we want to invite you to give a lecture about the Sira of the Prophet or, tell, you know, give a lecture about this or that. But no, don't talk to us about uh, this field organ trafficking and human trafficking. Well, I want to talk to you about it so I can give you the name of organizations that actually work to do something about it. Well, we, no, no, no. You know, this stuff belongs in a classroom at university. It's absurd. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligates us morally, when we are Muslims, to be at the cutting edge of ethical oversight. But you cannot witness from the, from the immoral position of sitting on a couch and doing nothing about it. Because if, if, if you are not ahead of others in doing what is good, then by what right are you going to witness, testify as to that good? You, you see what I'm saying? You, it, it is the, the, the moral obligation to, to witness is a moral obligation to do. Because a witness who says, well, go ahead, you, you do something about it. Then we fall into the, the other moral failure of those who say but do not do. Why, why, why do you say what you don't do? Okay. A lot, in a lot of Muslim countries, I, 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 I you know, it, it, because it's just the frustration at the, the, the fact that we are students of the Quran or we're supposed to be, 
but does bitter exist in our societies? Reflect on it. Reflect upon every society that you've dwelt, dwelt, dwelt in. How many of these societies have you experienced real bitter? Because real bitter, in a lot of Muslim countries, if you can't pay off your debts, you go to prison. You actually, you're imprisoned. This comes from French law, by the way. It doesn't come from Islamic law. It comes from French law. But because a lot of Muslim countries uh, transplanted French law, they, they imprison those who can't pay off their debts. But how many Muslim institutions exist that are committed to doing something about modern human trafficking or indentured service or the, the grotesque conditions of laborers in many parts of the world, sadly, among the worst human trafficking countries, some of them are Muslim countries. And again, it is remarkable that we recite this Quran all the time and live with these exist with, with these uh, realities when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us bear witness but there is no bearing witness without ad without bir and without taqwa but bir itself encompasses taqwa by the way okay then after that after iman and actually sacrificing to elevate the status of others comes Salah and Zakah. Now, after Salah and Zakah comes Walmufuna bi ahdihim idha ahadu. Again and again, how many times have we seen? In the ayat that we studied, Allah underscores that an essential part of moral character is that people can depend on your word. That if you say, I will do, then you will do. Al-Mufuna bil-Ahd, Al-Ahd is any obligation that you commit yourself to doing whether it's a contract, or whether it's a promise, or whether it's a date. So if you tell someone, you know, I'm going to come over at 6 o'clock, you cannot free yourself of that obligation without communication. Once you've given a promise, it's a promise. And you cannot ignore a promise. That's a moral issue. This teaching people to respect their word is something that starts in your childhood, something that you pick up from your parents. And again, how did it ever become that It, words have become to mean so little among Muslims. I mean, it is not, I, mean, I don't shock anyone when I say that um, a lot of people from my background will tell you, we don't, you know, we, we, uh, we try to avoid doing business with Muslims. I mean, in my legal practice, when I used to have legal practice, if I had Muslim clients, I would require Muslim clients to pay in advance because no one would give me an absolute headache in paying their bills like Muslims. If I had non-Muslim clients, I knew that I would send the bill and, it, you know, I give them 30 days to pay the bill, they'll pay it. But with Muslim clients, I knew it will be a song and dance through hard experience I've learned. So I would insist, regardless of how rich they are, and I've had clients who are among the wealthiest in the world. They have to pay in full in advance. 
you know, you have a retainer, and every time the retainer starts going down below a certain level, you say you have to pay up because effectively, but that is just, it blows your mind. How did we ever get to this position? How? Okay, and then, so, Bir doesn't exist unless, without material sacrifice and care for others. And Bir doesn't exist without Salah and Zakah again. And Al Wafa Bil Ahd, honoring your obligations. Was Sabrina fil Ba'sa, Wad Darra, Wahin al Ba's. So those who persevere, not lose faith, when they are tested with hardship and harm. al Ba'sa is hardship like poverty, like illness. al is anything that harms you or causes you pain. That's al darr Wahin al Ba's. Some commentators said that this means Wahin al Ba's is a specific reference to persevering or being patient when you are forced to go to war. But that's not the likely meaning. The likely meaning of Hin al Ba's is that you, those who Uh, persevere or those who hold themselves together upon the shock of harm. So Ba'sa are those who persevere in a in a course of hardship where you get you know the hardship exists day after day after day. But Hin al Ba's is when a calamity first falls you. There are people when upon being struck by a calamity they completely lose it. It, beca it becomes their undoing. But there is great virtue in being able to turn upon being struck by a calamity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That instead of your first reaction being, why God? Why me? The first reaction is, Allah, I accept, I accept what you decreed. Then those are described as الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا or الصَّادِقُونَ Those are those who deserve the status of الصَّادِقُونَ أَصْحَابِ الصدق. The true ones, and al muttaqun and the people of Taqwa. This area is at the heart of everything that shapes our understanding of law. Because as we will see, right after this, Surah Al-Baqarah will proceed to tell us various positive legal commandments about various things. But it anchored us, or anchored our attitude towards law in al tayyibat and in Al-Birr. Which again, I repeat, necessary for witnessing and testimony as, as we've said repeatedly. Now, why is this so critical? Because any rule of law that does not uphold a tayyibat and al birr has lost its course. So, for instance, these families who are selling their children in Afghanistan, 
according to the article, that some of these families are selling them, meaning selling them in marriage. They, they, they sell them off to be married to people who are much, much older than them. And in return for, quote unquote, the dowry being paid to the family. But a lot of these girls are children. And according to the article, they are citing Prophet's marriage to Aisha as legal proof that what they're doing is lawful. It, it takes a great deal of self-deception to cite the example of the Prophet's marriage to Aisha which is not a marriage entered into under duress and not a marriage entered into through daughter. And the, the position of the meaning of childhood changes from one age from another to another. In the the village that my family comes from in Egypt, it was quite common to see 12 years old, 12 year olds or 14 year olds as full grown women. In, in these villages where, you, where people grew up uh, eating what they eat, the, with the experiences they have working in fields, adulthood was attained early. But even then, with everything that we know about what modernity, the way that modernity shapes human consciousness, there is no doubt that you are, the, the consciousness of human beings is such that even a little girl in Afghanistan will dream of a world, what the world has exposed her to education, love, understanding, respect, these types of things. And you cannot come and ignore all of that and say, well, I'm citing the illegal precedent and here we go. I would respect you much more of say, I am doing what's wrong because I need to eat or I need to feed the other children. At, at least then we are confronting the issue with brutal, but invoking the law to do what is contra to al-tayyibat. And al a little girl that is being, that will be raped on her first night and will inevitably cry and will inevitably enter into a marriage, into a household which has much older uh, already existing wives who will use that little girl as a slave serving the family, because that's what always happens, that you can't describe that as a Taliban. You can't. So my point is that the very definition of a Taliban is applied morality, is applied ethics. It is not simply an a a a a rhetorical device. We say, well, and, and especially the way people have understood, ignored the entire Islamic tradition, and they think of Tayyibat is to eat halal meat. That, that's not, that is, you know, it, it, the, 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 um, the fringe of the fringe of what, what might constitute a Tayyibat. But, the moral responsibility burdens all of us because if Allah says al bir and Allah we are c commanded to attain bir and if that is the command and I am living my life not troubled by what happens to the orphans in Syria and I could tell you a lot of horrible horrible stories about what happens to orphans in Syria or what happens to the orphans in Yemen. Leave alone, I mean, the, the, the Muslims in China, that, that's even, 
or now what something like if i'm if if my heart doesn't talk to me doesn't interrogate me about the nature of my birth then we have a very serious problem then you are anchored in something but it's not islam